So good morning. I think we are, yeah, we are a little bit late. Uh, dear young professionals and dear friends and colleagues, uh, after the success of the Industry Day on Monday and the IF uh, Diversity uh, 3G platform yesterday, uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to the first IF Science and Academic, Ac Academic Day. And this completes more or less also the 3G initiative by celebrating the role of science and academia in the global effort um, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the global space sector. So science and academia are really very important drivers for research and innovation and also uh, to create and, and educate the space workforce of tomorrow. So uh, this is the first time that we are holding this kind of breakfast. It will be um, uh, integrated into the uh, IIF system every year. So the academic sector is the starting point of many careers and careers are full of experiences and success, but definitely not free of difficult moments and, and challenges. This is something what makes us all grow. And um, uh, it is important, you know, to understand and to see how we actually reach success. And uh, there's nothing better than uh, starting celebrations on such a topic with a meeting where uh, we can all interface and share our experiences and ideas. So today's breakfast is dedicated to the topic uh, developing success from failures. And thanks to this initiative organized by the IAF um, with the support of the International Space University, we will bring up discussions between experts of the space sector, students, um, uh, young professionals, and try to inspire and motivate a future uh, workforce and future representative of the space sector. So um, I would like now to give the word to our IAF president for diversity initiatives and science and academia relations, Deganit Baikowski, and she will introduce the panel and uh, how we will um, uh, design this breakfast. And thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Pascal. Good morning. So um, let me just say a few things. Um, science and academia are essential elements of uh, the global space, as they represent the fundamental driver for research and innovation and produce the workforce of tomorrow. Academia plays a vital role as a pillar category within the Federation with over a hundred universities and research and development organizations as IAF members, which corresponds to almost a quarter of the IAF community. So recognizing the importance of this field in our community, the IAF already established a dedicated committee, the IAF Space Universities Administrative Committee. The purpose of the committee is to encourage international collaboration among academic structures involved in space activities, including universities, research and development hubs for the promotion of universities' activities during the IAC, as well as providing a forum to discuss ways to train the next generation of space practitioners. So pursuing the mission of supporting the next generation and together with the International Space University, we have decided to focus this morning on developing success from failures. Failures are important for our development and yet we fear them. So let's face them this morning. We will bring up the discussion between these four amazing and, I should say, inspiring experts of the space sector, all of whom are ISU alumni, to share with us special moments in which they grew out of failure. So the, the first will be Emmanuel David. Emmanuel David is the executive manager of the EPFL Space Center, which leads a research initiative on sustainable space logistics. Emmanuel has 10 years experience in space transportation in academia, agency, and industry from pre-development projects up to launch operation. Uh, she started her career as young graduate trainee at the ESA office in Washington. She's, uh, she's been an active member of the SG, SGAC. She is a leader and volunteer in the IAF committee and on a local level, Emmanuel takes part of the Swiss Tech Ladies program, mentoring Swiss teenage girls to technical careers. 
Then we'll have uh, Ken Davidian uh, from the International Space University, Vice President for North American Operations. Ken has worked for the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Tran Transportation in Washington up until recently. And his, in his last position at the FAA, he served as the AST Director of Research and Program Manager of the AAA Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportations. Uh, transportation. Earlier in his career, um, Ken worked for the NASA Lewis Research Center, International Space University, Paragon Space Development Corporation, XPRIZE Foundation, and the NASA headquarters. Uh, currently, he serves as a member of the Ohio State University Aerospace Engineering External Advisory Board. He is the associated editor of the, well, I should say, distinguished New Space Journal. Uh, and is the chair of the IAF Entrepreneurial and Investment Committee and vice chair of the IAF Space Economy Committee. My colleague and friend and good friend, Joav Lanzmann, uh, CEO of Moonscape. Joav is a visionary space entrepreneur and a seasoned space engineer with 20 years of hands-on experience in the Israeli space industry. His last engineering full-time job was at Space IL where he was the senior system engineer and the deputy mission director of the Bereshit lunar lander, the first privately funded lunar landing mission. Yoav is also passionate about public outreach and education. He is the Karaman Fellow selected for his outstanding achievements in space and is considered a leader who is shaping the future of space. Since the end of the Bereshit mission in 2019, Yoav decided to contribute to the newly emerging moon programs he consults to several lunar startups and has recently moved to Luxembourg and founded Moonscape, a lunar remote sensing startup company. Last but not least is Jenna Tiwana. Jenna is European Business Development and Partnerships Officer at iSpace, working out of the Luxembourg office, where in addition to her role, she, ha she also contributes to crafting the company's strategy as they go to the moon. Previously, she was management consultant in, at Bain and Company for four years, gaining particular experience in private equity and strategy cases, working in a range of industries across both London and Tokyo offices. She is founder and sponsor of the Icarus Prize, awarded to the students with the best individual project related to commercial space activities, including business, financial, or investment strategy. In her spare time, uh, she also volunteers with non-profit organizations in space industry from across the world. So let the show begin. Emmanuel, you'll go first. Um, so thank you everyone for having me here uh, today. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's very nice also for me to be here talking in my city. I'm from Paris, so I'm very uh, happy to be there and I hope you're enjoying the uh, the conference. Um, talking about failures to successes, it's a very difficult uh, thing to do. Uh, I was like, whoa, <laughs> what am I going to say? You have to, I have to make myself vulnerable in front of an audience I don't know. Uh, so, but I'm going to uh, go for it. And uh, I think it also goes uh, in the line of what I want to talk about. Um, so I was thinking, okay, what failures I, I did, it's difficult because when you look backwards, you're like, I didn't fail, I tried things, things worked, uh, since, uh, things didn't work, and the, uh, the stuff that worked, at, at the end, they, they become the successes. Uh, but it, it's also difficult. W one thing that I, I think I, I would name it was a failure or maybe a mistake or like a misconception is a... Uh, um, I always thought, okay, I'm a woman, I'm in space, uh, there's no difference. When I was a kid, I was playing with boys, I don't see the difference with them. Uh, then I go, I'm good in math, I'm good in physics, I continue my, my studies, I want to build rockets, I'm uh, going to be a space engineer, aerospace engineer, and, and everything goes fine, and I don't see the difference. And then I start, and I come at the workplace, and people look at me and like, wow, you're a space engineer, is it hard as a woman? And you're like, no, I, I don't understand. What are you talking about, guys? Uh, not guys, like people, <laughs> please. Um, then I continue and, and I see, and, and I, I didn't see like so much different with my peers, and, and I was con continuing my career. Um, but I would say um, three years ago, I became a mother for the first time, and, I, and then is the moment where I saw, ah, 
maybe they <laughs> had a bit of misconception that I could do it like my uh, male peers, um, that I'm experiencing the same and that is going to be as, as them. And, and no, uh, it's, it's not the same. Um, as a woman, uh, you're expected to work uh, as if you have no family and to have a family as uh, if you're not working. The society is putting a lot of pressure on you and actually you enter in a world <laughs> that no one told you about. <laughs> uh, a world where people ask you, uh, uh, you say, I want to become a mother, I'm, gonna, I'm pregnant, and they tell you, but uh, are you going to be able to make it? You should reduce your workload because you cannot make it. And then I'm thinking, I ask my male uh, peers, but when you said that, uh, when you said you would get your first child, did people tell you you, you would not be able to make it? And say, no. On the contrary, I got promoted because I can take more responsibility. And I'm like, but you're not responsible then of the kids if you're at work. <laughs> um, so th this is something. Um, I come to a conference, people ask me, but you left your kids alone? I'm like, no, there is another parent or there are other people taking care of them. I'm not the only one in charge of them. And then I'm asking my male peers, but when you go to conference, do people ask you what you're doing with your kids? No. So um, I think there's a big like mind shift to do there. Uh, and I think it's, it's pretty difficult. And I guess maybe people who are fathers here, or maybe they were not asked these questions, or people who, like maybe the male uh, that are in this room who uh, think about building a family, they are not scared that it's going to impact their career. Um, so keep this in mind. And then I would say, it's important also in order to overcome this uh, challenge uh, that, that we all like, move on this together. And that's why also I wanted to talk about this uh, uh, today. It's important to, as a male to congratulate your partner about the work they are doing, to really recognize this all unpaid work they are doing, to be grateful for that. At the workplace also, I think it's important to be mindful about the experience of other people. And I think this goes like in general, be mindful about what people can be experiencing at home because it, it can be difficult. Um, at, the, at work also with your colleagues, um, avoid to plan meetings after 5, 6 p.m. so people can go and take care of their kids. But this goes also for everyone. So then you give also the space for people to have, a, I would say, a life after work, to propose daycare options, babysitter hours for kids, uh, sick kids, uh, childcare at conference. This is something that would help out a lot of people, I think, in their planning. And, um, but I'm also very confident because I see a generation that is coming, that is aware also of all these challenges. Uh, I think um, maybe the mistake or misconception I had uh, to think I can do it like as my male peers because it's have the same conditions. Uh, this is going to be different and uh, we're all here to, to make it change. And um, I see also at the university, the younger generation, they, they really know uh, about this, they're, they're more, uh, conscious about this. And last, um, it might be a bit cheesy, but some, sometimes when you see a challenge, and this was my challenge, uh, but everyone has his own challenge, uh, I always think about the quote of, uh, of uh, GFK, wh wh when he says, uh, we go to the moon because, uh, and we do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I think it applies to anything that uh, we can do. And when I doubt, I'm like, okay, I'm doing this. It's not because it's easy, it's hard, uh, but at the end, it's totally worth it. Thank you. I guess I'm next. Hello, everybody. My name is Ken Davidian. I work for the International Space University. I have to look through the room very quickly to see if any of my former bosses are here, <laughs> just to be sure. <laughs> because I don't want to make anybody mad, right? Um, so when talking about failures, I had to think about this quite a bit because there's been some failures and they were mostly failures in judgment, I would say, and these are kind of failures you don't recognize until way after the fact. Um, I started off talking this, during this entire incredible week with uh, the International Project and Program Management Committee um, and talking about different paradoxes in mer management dualities versus dualisms, either ors versus, you know, ands, and keeping some sort of balance between two paradoxical, two uh, diametrically opposed poles, and how these poles kind of move around and you're kind of never sure where they are and you're trying to find a balance of synergies between them. And to me, 
misinterpreting where that balance, where that trade-off is between those two poles, for me, has led to what I might call failures, but it's, a lot of times it's a matter of perspective. So I've got three instances here, and I should have started my timer a little bit earlier. So the first one I would talk about is when to stay in, in your job or when to leave your job. So I have been the biggest failure in terms of if I had to rate myself against what I tell young professionals to do and what I myself do, I am a massive failure. I stayed in my first job, the, not in the same company, in the same job with the same pay scale and all that sort of stuff for 16 years. Don't do that, right? <laughs> I loved my job. The, the paradox is I love my job, but this is not a wise decision career-wise, so short-term versus long-term gratification. Um, the sec and then I had a bunch of jobs, five jobs in five years, which don't do that, but sometimes you have to. And then I got a job, this last one, and that's why I'm looking for my bosses, um, 14 years in the same job. I absolutely loved it, but it's, don't do that. I mean, if you want to rise up and rise up and all that sort of stuff, probably staying in the same job for 14 years is not a, a good way to do that. So this balance of when to leave and when to go, it's hard to do because if you love what you're doing, it's, it's a very hard decision to make. The second dichotomy that I think I wanted to highlight was when to take a, a, a problem, an issue that you're having, up to your bosses to get resolution, to get help with resolution. And there's a whole lot of paradoxes here, but you want to be able to show your boss that you're capable, that you can handle this situation, that, you know, not a problem, I've got it con under control, just give me some time. But, you know, you hear the bosses saying all the time, no problem, my door is wide open, you can come talk to me, I'm here to help, you know, my job is to make you successful. And then you go there finally, and they say, suck it up. You know, you take care of it, this is the way it is. You can't, you know, we can't change that. So it's hard to know when to take a problem to your boss. You, you know, you, there's the old Dr. Phil saying that says, the only person that thinks about you as much as you do is you. Right? So your bosses don't think about you as much as you think about you, right? Your bosses have 12 individuals to think about, or you know, two dozen individuals to think about, and you think about you all the time. I mean, it's only natural. So when to take information to your boss and what kind of information, right? You can't hit them with all the detail in the world. We see this a lot of time in weekly summaries. Some people give pages and pages of information when your boss wants one or two sentences. So trying to make that decision of when to take something to the boss. And the example in my case was with COVID. COVID was hitting the United States in March of 2020. And we saw it coming from the West Coast, you know, in Seattle, moving across the East. And the federal agencies in the United States were taking precautions. They were starting to, well, we'll try a telework day on Wednesday. It was Monday, I remember. I went into my boss's office and I said, I'm teleworking tomorrow because this is going nuts. I'm not coming in tomorrow. You can take and tell work day on Wednesday. So basically I'll be out. I said, I don't know if I need your permission or not, but I'm going to do it. And if you say no, then I'll just take sick leave and bada bing. And, and his response, and it was a he, and he's got a military background was no, you know, because his orders were stay in the office. You will not, you know, we're not sending these home. The bosses up above them said, you know, you know, we're staying in the office. This is not a real thing yet. And, there was a di the paradox there. Do I listen to my boss or do I go with my gut? And, you know, I went with my gut. But that's an example of when to up-level issues to your boss and when to defy your boss in that case. And I would say that the final, <laughs> this is kind of a funny one, the final failure is when failure leads to success, right? So life is not a meritocracy. We think life is a meritocracy. All our governments write rules to try to make it look like life is a meritocracy, like the best person gets the job, right? And we know that doesn't happen. Uh, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. So <laughs> I remember back, I was in, at NASA Lewis, and we were doing laser ignition of a combustion chamber, and we had booked these, we had taken a uh, liquid rocket engine combustion chamber, put some quartz uh, windows in it, we we're gonna shoot some lasers in there to ignite the combustion, to ignite the propellants inside this combustion chamber, and we blew the thing up, right? And so you, this massive operational failure, and we end up getting a prize for it, you know, getting an award for it. Oh, outstanding achievement in an operational blah, blah, blah. And, and so, and there was another one where I was working with a partner organization, and for whatever reason, I was really making them mad. 
I was making them very, very mad because they were coming at, to us with unreasonable terms and I was, you know, pushing back. And, you know, I've, never have I ever felt like I was going to have a heart attack when in dealing with them. And then so I got them so mad that they gave me an award and they asked me to retire. So, you know, so this is where, you know, superficially it looks like you're being uh, uh, celebrated, but in fact, you know, the failure has led to the, the, the you know, being taken out of the, the running. So anyways, these are three failures that I think are, are kind of interesting. Again, paradoxes, when to change jobs, when to up-level uh, ideas to your boss, or you know, when actual failures lead to success. Um, so that's my time, and I'll pass it on now to, I guess, uh, Yoav. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, where do I start? Um, I see uh, a lot of young professionals here, and um, well, I'm, I'm not so young anymore, but am I a professional? I think that uh, if you listen to, to the Ganit and you heard the list of achievements that I've made, uh, so yeah, sure, yeah, you would think that I'm a professional, but my inner voice keeps telling me that maybe I achieved these achievements from, because of different reasons someone liked me for some reason, or they were biased, or they selected me, or given me awards because there were no one else, or some other silly reason, but this is what's going in my mind. And uh, it has a name. It's a very common phenomenon. It's called imposter syndrome. And you won't believe how common it is. Now that I have a long list of achievements, like I flew a mission to the moon. I literally saved a very expensive satellite from imminent catastrophe. And uh, I was selected for the Kalman project. Um, I can't deny that, right? But when I was much younger and at my early career, um, I didn't have that list. Today, I literally take a list of achievements with me all places because I need to remind myself that because I tend to forget it. That uh, sounds um, unreasonable, and it is, uh, but this is how it is. And um, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. When, when I was about to graduate from my bachelor degree in aerospace engineering at the Technion Haifa, Israel, um, I saw an, um, a recruitment ad uh, for a spacecraft, uh, for a satellite engineer at IAI, um, the space industry was much smaller back then, and uh, it, it was something that uh, was almost unheard of. So uh, this was very exciting for me, but I got home and told my wife that um, I saw this ad, but I don't dare to apply because I don't think I'm worthy. There were tons of students better than me, and who am I to, to apply for this dream job, right? Um, my wife, my wife is a very determined person, and she told me um, in loud voice, by the way, that I should pick up the phone and call them now. And I did. And here I am. Because if I wouldn't do that, I'm not sure that I was uh, going to start uh, my career in the space industry at all. And um, the same doubts return every time there's a big decision uh, like uh, applying for a master's degree or uh, deciding to quit my job or uh, starting an entrepreneurship uh, career or um, almost any uh, big decision. Uh, I always have these doubts. So I need a reminder for that and I need uh, the support of my uh, colleagues and family and friends um, because at the beginning of the career, it's, it's very hard. It's really, really hard because the list of achievement is something that you haven't got yet, uh, mostly. So my advice is basically to, uh, first of all, start this list now. Um, this list is something that, uh, that can help you a lot. And um, the achievements can be very small. It can be uh, finishing your degree. It can be uh, starting a family. 
it can uh, it it can be all these uh, rather small things. Maybe I'm not sure that starting a family is a small thing, but but things that uh, that that most people do in life, and um, we don't think about uh, about them as achievements, but they are. Um, and for employers or managers, I would say, um, be aware of that. Give more positive feedback. Tell your uh, employees that uh, they did a good job because, well, all of us seek validation, right? But some of us need it much more. And otherwise, the lack of validation might block us from really fulfilling our potential. And that's, of course, a shame. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm living for many years with, my, with this treacherous brain, uh, but I keep reminding myself that the same brain is the thing that got me to where I am. The achievements is because of that, right? So this is part of my personality, I guess. And um, now that I, I live with it so, for so long, I, I can notice the symptoms, right, the, the things that people say that probably uh, say that they already think the same and doubt themselves. And you won't believe what high-ranking people have the same thoughts, the same doubts, like bank managers, general managers of huge corporations, um, and ministers and, and people that, that have done a lot, of, a lot of good and great things, um, those thoughts are still in our minds. And um, I don't know, maybe everybody got it, but not everybody uh, admits it because we don't talk about it enough. So um, this is what I have to say. And uh, thank you very much. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Jenna, and um, firstly it's just really reassuring to hear this panel, I think for me, you know, it's, I think we're all at different stages of our careers and have different experiences, but it's so reassuring and helpful to know that, you know, exactly as you have said, you're not, like, you know, you do think back and you're like, God, I wasn't, I'm not the only one that feels like this, so, you know, it's really, in any case, it's really nice just to hear everyone's experiences. Um, so this speech is a little bit strange for me, actually, because... I've spent so much of my time and energy um, trying to mitigate failure and to the extreme. And actually, for me, that's where a failure dawned from. So back in 2020, I felt like I was on the fast track in my career. So I was working for one of the top management consultancies in the world, working all over the world. Um, my passion was the space industry, so I had founded loads of initiatives. Um, I was co-founder of the Next Gen Network at the British Interplanetary Society. Um, I was working a lot with SGAC, the most pioneering and amazing working groups. Um, and so what I was really doing was I was doing what everyone else around me seemed to do. Um, and I was trying to keep up, but actually not only just keep up, but get ahead. So this is the thing with our industry, right? We're here because we're passionate about it and we love it. Um, and that means that we all do so much. And now having worked outside the industry, actually on average, I think people in the space industry contribute so much more through passion. So I was doing what everyone else was doing, working for all these amazing groups um, and, and just trying to keep up, trying to progress my career like everyone else was. And a few things happened in 2020. Um, obviously, COVID was a, was a big one. Um, my grandmother passing away was another one. But for me, what that meant was... You know, COVID, don't have to commute to the office, wonderful, more time to work. Grandma passing away, I mean, work is a welcome distraction from that pain. And so it all came back to life is happening, changes in life are happening, but I'm always going to keep focusing, keep pressing on, it's going to be worth it, you know, thinking ahead, I know where I want to get to. And that's really where my failure began, because my, my failure started from failing to take care of myself. And... Let, let, let me tell you, I was the first one person at, at this point to date. Um, at that point, I had mental health. Yes, it's important. Let me meditate for a minute before I start work. Okay, wonderful. That was the mentality I had. 
Um, and so this idea of mental health was a word. It was kind of linked to being important, but I didn't really embody it or feel it. So when people would mention it, I was like, okay, great, yeah, it's important. So it's physical health, wonderful. Um, but really my failure began when I didn't take care of my mental health. And it's really strange because I couldn't compute what was going on at first, right? So every time something had gone wrong in my life, whether it's parents divorcing or bad relationships, I had just channeled more energy into work and things had gone better at work. I got promoted faster, so life was fine. Like, great, you know, doing what I wanted to do on that road. Um, but this time, the more I worked, the worse I felt, and I just couldn't understand that. And it got to a point where I was working from 7 a.m. to 2, 3 a.m. nearly every single day. Um, and this wasn't stemmed out of energy and passion, it was stemmed out of anxiety. So as an example, I would finish work at 1 a.m. in my job, um, send out the client deck that I triple, quadruple checked, and then without an alarm, my body would wake me up at 2.30 a.m. to recheck that deck. So I'd be working again. And it was that anxiety that fueled this ridiculous, unsustainable routine. And that was extrapolating to, my, to a lot of different things, not just my day job. So I was at a place where I was so stressed and so short of time that I was missing meetings. Um, the initiatives that I actually cared about, I couldn't contribute my all to, which was frustrating. And it got to a point where a mentor at work had to intervene and had to tell me to go see a doctor and take time off work because he knew that I would never do that. Um, and now I felt like a real failure, you know, because everyone around me is still continuing to work, still managing to juggle all these things. Um, and here I am watching the world go by, forcing myself to slow down. And by forcing myself to slow down, I mean painting by numbers and going on like hour-long walks because I couldn't jog because I was told by the doctor that I can't because at this point my heart rate was so high and it wouldn't come down and my blood tests were coming back as abnormal. So I was told by doctors I couldn't even jog, I had to walk. Um, I learned how to crochet because I was literally seeking things out to make me slow down. Um, and that is where I think the failure of mitigating failure had such an impact on me because it was through all of that process, I had to learn to accept myself, accept the, what my definition of doing my best was. Um, and ultimately, I think that's helped me in three ways. Um, so the first one is I think I'm just generally a happier person, which I think makes me a nicer person to be around. Like, I'm not talking to you and thinking about five other things, which often I did. Um, from a work perspective, I... I can mitigate burnout before I get there. So ultimately, I can be relied upon. I don't have to take chunks out of work. Um, you know, I'm way more proactive in, in managing my workload. And, and if something needs to slip to the next day, that's fine. It's not the end of the world. The world's not going to come crashing down. Um, and the last thing is, actually, I've learned that doing three things to 100% is infinitely better than doing six things to 50%. And that means that not only for me, myself, am I giving more to what I care about, it means I'm also being an effective peer and uplifting others. Because when opportunities come my way, rather than taking on the world, I can give it to others. And we can form this really supportive ecosystem where we share opportunities. So actually, distributing opportunities to others and not having to do everything yourself to progress this industry isn't a bad thing. Um, and so I guess my, my main message is just don't be like me, because it is not worth it. Your health is not worth it. <laughs> um, you know, don't compare yourself to others because, again, that's just never going to work. You are never going to be the same. You are never going to be able to match the KPIs and the, the indicators to everyone else, so don't do it. Um, and really, if you want to contribute to this industry, because we are all passionate about it, that's why we're here 8 a.m., day four of this conference, <laughs> if you are really passionate about it, take care of yourself because that's the way you're going to help the industry best not by you burning out and you not being able to contribute it to it. So, yeah, that's my, that's my takeaway. Thank you. Thank you so much, all four of you. Wow. I have to uh, say that when we first uh, envisioned this uh, event, this is, what I, this is not what I had in mind. Um, and I'm glad. Uh, and I want to thank you all 
so much uh, because you've taught us a good lesson. First of all, that we have different types of failures, different types of perceptions about what is failure and obviously what is also a success. Um, thank you all for being so personal and for sharing. It is not trivial. Um, and you are very courageous to stand here or sit here before us and, and share your most personal inner voices. Uh, and we appreciate it. We appreciate that. Um, and what I've learned today is that uh, we are not so unique, at least not in terms of our failures. So, uh, and we shouldn't be lonely about it. Uh, so sharing is powerful. So thank you very much for sharing. Uh, if you're up to it, uh, would you like to take a question from the audience? So if anyone has a question to the amazing four. So my question is for Gina. So I often find myself uh, the same um, that when I want to, to have more success at work and when I want to go deep into my work, I have to work many more hours. So I work until very late in the night and um, I need to invest a lot of time in order to understand many details and, and make a progress. And then when you want to start a family, obviously you can't do that. So I guess I want to ask how, how do you compensate for your desire to keep your working load and a uh, and new family. Hi. So um, um, I would say when, when you start to have a family, you realize uh, you're really good at prioritizing what you need. And then you realize that there's a lot of things that you were doing that are, were not bringing so much value. And so I have to say my days are really productive. And um, now when I work, it's like when I do seven hours of work, they're like full productive time. And when you're not at work, then you, you do other things. The, the other part is that, um, and this is proven, is that uh, when you're not at work, your, your mind is, is doing other things, but it means you're, you're resting a bit your mind and then you are more productive when you start working because you're, you were not always doing it. And also, most creative ideas come where you are actually not at work. And so this gives you also like uh, ways and other situations to, uh, to think about it, because you can still think about, uh, about your work and, and then find solutions while you're doing something else, while, while you're cooking, while you're uh, cleaning the dishes or uh, making your laundry. And then you're like, ah, okay, now I got the solution. And then at work the next day you can implement it. So you can always adapt. Thank you. Well, although it's uh, fascinating listening to you, but our time is, is up, so we have to free everybody for your day. Thank you very much for joining us this morning and enjoy the rest of the events that we have for you for the academic day. We have a plenary session on James Webb Telescope, another press conference later, so keep tuned and enjoy the day. Thank you.